Welcome back to the Real Life Pharmacology Podcast. As always, definitely check out reallifepharmacology.com. I've got that free giveaway. It's a great resource. Uh, Top 200 drugs where I highlight three really important things uh, from each of those top 200 uh, medication. Definitely things you could be tested on uh, throughout your nursing, pharmacy, uh, med school, whichever um, healthcare profession you're in. If you're taking a pharmacology class, you, you'll definitely be tested on those things. So free and easy uh, to go subscribe and uh, get that um, free resource for you. So today I'm going to talk about anticholinergic medications. Probably more specifically, I'm going to talk about some of the urinary anticholinergic medications. So examples here, oxybutynin, brand name Ditropan. Uh, tolteridine, Detrol, uh, a couple others, Darafenacin, uh, Nablex, Solafenacin, uh, Vesicare. Now the mechanism of action and where these medications might be used, uh, these meds block what are called muscarinic receptors, and specifically in the bladder urinary tract region, it is the M3 uh, receptor. I've definitely seen that come up on uh, test questions and different things like that. So they block these muscarinic receptors and in the, the bladder and the urinary tract region that can um, cause an, a, a contraction and which it can increase urine volume in the bladder and it can also potentially uh, reduce uh, frequency and urge. So probably the most uh, frequent situation you're going to see these meds used in uh, is uh, urinary frequency and urge incontinence. Now, with that said, I, I mentioned that they do kind of um, cause constriction. They kind of help uh, block or reduce the urine flow from coming out. So we do have to be a little bit careful in patients that may be at risk for urinary retention. That's a situation where we don't want to hold that urine back, maybe any more than we already are doing. Um, maybe in a setting of BPH where that prostate is enlarged and impeding flow um, out of the body as far as urine goes. So definitely remember that that is a, a potential side effect uh, with these medications. So again, you know, urinary frequency, urge incontinence, uh, overactive bladder. Sometimes you'll see it used for uh, patients who have bladder spasms as well. Uh, so a few different uses for those meds there. Now side effects, I kind of started talking about a little bit. You've got to uh, remember that potential for urinary retention. That can certainly happen. Um, anticholinergic effects, uh, there's a couple ways to remember these. You can't spit, see, pee, or poop. So pee is the urinary retention. Spit is dry mouth. Uh, can't see is you maybe can have some uh, blurred vision and, and things of that nature. Also dry eyes can definitely happen. Uh, can't poop. Uh, so that's constipation. Another way to remember it is the acronym SLUD. So that's salivation, uh, lacrimation, uh, urination and defecation. So you can't do those things. Uh, so hopefully between those two that kind of helps you remember. Continuing on the side effect piece of this, you definitely have to watch out for confusion uh, and fall risk as well with any anticholinergic medication. Now there is some subtleties uh, within this class of meds. Uh, I would say oxybutynin is generally classified as the uh, oldest and maybe the least selective for the bladder tissue. So that may be a little bit uh, higher risk. Again, this is all dose dependent. If you go to a really high dose of another one, you know, you might um, have just as many problems as you would at a low dose of oxybutynin. So always keep that in mind. Uh, that dose does certainly matter as far as those side effects, but in a dose-per-dose -dose comparison or, or close dosages, um, generally oxybutynin is probably going to be the one that causes the highest risk for CNS effects like confusion and, and falls, and potentially some of those other side effects as well. They can't spit, see, pee, or poop.
Now, in my practice working in the community with uh, geriatric patients as well as in uh, long-term care, assisted living, things like that, one really important thing to do is to assess if these medications are actually helping. I've seen so many patients where you ask them, you know, has it been helping? Does it work? And they say, you know, I really didn't notice a difference. Well, there's a lot of potential side effects, which I already just talked about, that can happen from these medications. So definitely make sure you ask the question, is this medication working for you? Because if it isn't, uh, we've got a lot of collateral damage that can happen, and there's really no reason uh, to be on the medication if their symptoms haven't improved at all. With urinary frequency, uh, I think of medications that can maybe exacerbate this, and uh, probably the biggest one, again, these meds are mostly used in geriatrics, the urinary anticholinergics, but the uh, biggest thing I, I look out for is diuretics. Diuretics can increase frequency of urination. Uh, sometimes there's not much we can do about the diuretic, but you know if it's strictly chlorthalidone or hydrochlorothiazide being used for hypertension and our patient is complaining about frequency, maybe we can switch it uh, to something else. Now, if you're talking about furosemide in a CHF patient and there's really not much else we can do as far as uh, getting rid of that fluid in CHF, uh, we may not be able to, to do much there other than kind of monitor for the um, adverse effects and, and monitor the patient. With that frequency, uh, many patients will struggle at night and it will interrupt their sleep. So this is a challenge to know exactly you know, what to do and how to manage that. One question I always ask um, because I definitely see it periodically, uh, what time is that patient taking their diuretic if they indeed are on one? Because if they're taking that diuretic late in the afternoon, early evening, or at bedtime, that could definitely cause some nighttime frequency, which we might be trying to treat with a urinary anticholinergic. Let's take a quick break from our sponsor, meded101.com, and we'll come back and I'll touch on drug interactions to finish up this podcast. Meded101.com slash store, S-T-O-R-E, has a growing list of resources for med students, pharmacy students, nursing students. Go check it out. Plenty of good test prep material, as well as uh, general education about uh, professional medication management and learning the ropes and how to become a better healthcare professional when it comes to medication management. So again, meded101.com slash store, and we appreciate the sponsorship there. Go check out their uh, resources and certainly support uh, this podcast as well. Let's wrap up here on a few drug interactions. So first one I really want to point out, these drugs commonly used in the elderly, and they can contribute to confusion and CNS changes. So Patients on dementia medications, the urinary anticholinergics, can block or blunt their effects. So good examples here are acetylcholinesterase inhibitors, uh, example being uh, Dinepazil, which brand name is, is Aricept. So they kind of oppose each other in their mechanism of action there, and the urinary anticholinergics can potentially blunt the effects, the benefits from those dementia medications. Uh, constipation with any anticholinergic, we have to remember that. So we can have an additive type effect. A classic example being uh, opioids can cause constipation. If we use opioids with anticholinergics, we definitely have uh, the opportunity for profound uh, constipation in that setting. So definitely uh, keep those type of patients in mind. Uh, these anticholinergics, uh, especially maybe the older ones, uh, oxybutynin, tolteridine, they may have a little bit more CNS depressant type effect. So keep in mind your patients on benzodiazepines, on any type of sleeper, on opioids. These can kind of have a cumulative effect where it might 
kind of zonk our patients out, potentially contribute to confusion, sedation, things of, of that nature. And then you also want to keep an eye out for other anticholinergic medications. And by far, the classic anticholinergic medication that is available over the counter is Benadryl. It's often found in Tylenol PM, Advil PM, uh, generic name is, is diphenhydramine. You've got to ask and assess if the patient is taking anything for allergies, if they're taking anything over the counter for sleep, because those anticholinergic effects can really pile on top of one each other and we can end up with a you know, dry mouth, dry eyes, urinary retention, constipation, uh, confusion, cognitive changes um, with add-ons like that. One other medication that I, I do see used periodically, older um, antihistamine, anticholinergic type medication is hydroxazine, sometimes used for anxiety, sometimes used for itching, uh, can be used for a whole bunch of different things. So keep that one in mind as well uh, when you're looking at medication lists and making sure that we're not piling on other medications that can contribute to uh, anticholinergic effects. So with that, I think that wraps up the episode for today. Reallifepharmacology.com, I've got that free giveaway. Absolutely feel free to uh, take advantage of that. Also, you'll get updates on uh, when there's a new podcast out, which I hope uh, helps aid your studying for any pharmacology and or uh, board exams. So we'll wrap up for today. I'm Eric Christensen, uh, pharmacist. Enjoy educating. Please leave us a rating review on iTunes. Uh, if you uh, enjoy the podcast there. So take care, have a great rest of your day, and uh, we'll see you next week.